Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. First, big round of applause for Kevin because Kevin's organized this whole thing with a great team. <clears throat> well, I'm going to try to be a prophet today. <laughs> I'm not going to try to make a prophet. Um, but I did go to Stanford. <laughs> Twice. Stanford undergrad, Stanford business school. But I bought a hotel in Berkeley, the Hotel Durant. How many of you men have ever been in the, the public restroom there? You have seen this. A cardinal red urinal <laughs> with a bullseye with the Stanford logo. Now it took an awful lot for me to do that. But since I'm in enemy, enemy territory here, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm, I'm friends. We're, you know, I'm going to talk about psychology today. So long story short is in 1987, a couple years after I graduated from Stanford Business School, I started my own company. I called it Joie de Vivre, a very impractical name for a company because hard to pronounce, hard to spell. Most people don't know what it means. But there are very few companies in the world whose... Uh, mission statement is also the name of the company. And we're in the business of creating joy. That was my purpose for myself, our employees, and our customers. Fast forward from 1987 to 2001, at which time we are the largest hotelier in the Bay Area. Uh, we had 20 hotels tw around the Bay Area. And frankly, 2001 was, in 2000 was a great time to be a Bay Area hotelier, but in 2001, it was a different story. That dot-com boom became a bust, what else happened in 2001? We had 9-11, uh, so nobody wanted to jump on a plane after that. We went to war with the Afghans the Afga in Afghanistan, and we made Fortress America. We made it very hard for people to come to the U.S. to actually to, to visit here. Then SARS happened. Asian travel dropped by 90%. Number one place that Asians travel to when they come to the U.S. is the Bay Area. All of our hotels were in the Bay Area. And then we were called Joie de Vivre. Now, I don't really know if you remember back in 2003, we, as Americans, stopped eating French fries. <laughs> well, we never will do that, actually. <laughs> we'll continue to eat French fries, but we started calling them what? <laughs> and we started boycotting French companies. What's the name of my company? So I started getting these emails from Orange County and Danville. <laughs> and <laughs> they would write me and say, we're boycotting you because we're boycotting all French companies. I would write back and say, wait a minute, we're not French, we're based in San Francisco. And I'd get this terse response back saying, oh, that's worse. So <laughs> San Francisco's left of Paris. So um, at a time when I had no money, I had a thousand employees in the company, I was worried about making payroll, I ended up in the local bookstore looking for a business book but within about two minutes, I realized what I really needed was a self-help book. <laughs> and I ended up in the self-help section of the bookstore. And that's where I got reacquainted with Abraham Maslow's Toward a Psychology of Being and a series of his books. And I sat there at Borders Bookstore at Union Square for three hours on the floor reading his book. And as I was reading it and reacquainting myself with his most iconic uh, uh, psychological theory, the hierarchy of needs pyramid, I start asking myself the question, if individuals can actually self-actualize, why can't a company? And so we took the idea of the hierarchy of needs and we turned it into three key themes that anybody could apply in their life. Survival, physiological and safety needs, succeed, your social belonging and esteem needs, and transformation, when you're in that self-actualized state, being all you can be, uh, to steal a, a phrase from the army who stole it from Maslow, uh, then you're in a transformative state. We applied this to all of our employees, our customers, and our investors. Next thing we knew, our housekeepers, who actually clean toilets for a living, were feeling somewhat transformed by the experience. And between 2001 and 2006, when the Bay Area experienced the largest percentage revenue drop in the history of American hotels since World War II, and we were the largest Bay Area hotelier, we tripled in size when a lot of our competitors didn't, partly because of a psychological theory. All right, well, that worked. Then more recently, we've had another downturn. In fact, we've had here in the Bay Area two once-in-a-lifetime downturns in the same decade. And during that first downturn, the dot-com bust, 
I felt like a gladiator. And I think as a company, we were up for it. But I have to admit that in this downturn, the one we're still in, I felt a little bit more like a prisoner for a variety of reasons. I felt like a prisoner because I was, I'd written a book and I was going out and giving speeches and I was loving the idea of spreading the idea of what I call karmic capitalism to the world uh, in this book, Peak, and the idea of Maslow's hierarchy needs applied to the world. But I also was actually going through some difficult times. I had a relationship that was ending. I had a son who had some uh, legal troubles. I had financial problems galore with the company. And I didn't want to be doing what I was doing anymore. So I was, I was actually a bit in a depressed state. So I also had some friends who were depressed. I was not the only person that I knew who was depressed. One of them was my friend Chip. We share a name. We were also mirrors for each other, both inside and outside. Chip was my same age. Chip was my insurance broker for 12 years. Chip was somebody who, on the external, was very uh, gregarious, emotionally aware, supposedly, I hope I am, uh, psychologically interested, spiritually curious. On the inside, he was deep, but he had, he had a melancholy streak. And this downturn took him in a different direction and took him in a very dark direction, and he ended up committing suicide. And so to go to uh, a friend of yours, it's hard enough to go to a friend's suicide, to a, a memorial service for someone who, who is a close friend, uh, it's harder still when he has the same name as you, and he actually is just like you. And people go to the stage and tell their chip stories at the very time that you personally are full of depression yourself. It was a wake-up call. We call that, a, it's a little hotel lingo. Um, it was a wake, <laughs> sorry. It was a wake-up call. <laughs> Thank you, let's break, break, break the somberness there. But it was a wake-up call for me. I had another wake-up call two months later. This was July of, of 2008 that I went to, June of 2008, I went to his memorial. August 19th, 2008, I was on crutches. I'd broken my ankle playing baseball. I had a bacterial infection in my leg that, was, uh, that almost led to an amputation of my leg. <clears throat> so I was on very strong antibiotics. I was in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I was giving a speech. At the end of my speech, I sat down on stage like this to sign books. And within about two minutes, I went unconscious. And um, I was unconscious for about three or four minutes. Within 10 minutes, the paramedics arrived, thank God, because 10 minutes after I went unconscious, my heart stopped. I went flatline. So I, in essence, died. Not by my own choice, um, but... It was another wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for me to say, what the heck am I doing with my life? During the course of 2008 and 2009, I had five different friends commit suicide, all within three years of my age, all of them men, all of them business people. And during that time, I was looking for some meaning in my life. I didn't want, you know, I'd had my flatline experience. I didn't want to do it consciously. I didn't want to do it on purpose. And I started studying a little bit about suicide. And here's some facts, very sobering facts. 100 people in America will actually commit suicide today. Mo there will be, will be more suicides in 2011, or there are every year, than there are homicides. It's, uh, the f men are four times more likely to commit suicide than women. It's the seventh leading cause of death for men. And get this, college students, it's the second leading co uh, cause of death amongst college students in America. For every one person who commits suicide and pass away, passes away, there are 19 who actually try to commit suicide and actually are, they don't die. So there are almost a million people a year in America who actually commit suicide. The most interesting spike up in the last two th or three years is that the suicide rate has grown amongst men between age 45 and 50. Mostly, in many cases, people who have had some economic uh, challenge with the, with the downturn. So I was reading this and thinking, what the heck can I do? And so I was looking at my own life and I started reading another psychologist. I guess for some reason, when a d I only took one psychology class in college, but for some reason, as a business person and as a CEO, when I'm going through difficult times, I, I turn to psychologists. 
How many of you have read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? Probably the most famous book ever written on, on meaning, Viktor Frankl, a psychologist from the 1930s in Austria, found himself in a concentration camp in 1940, 1941 with his family. F full family split up. He ended up uh, living. Most of his family passed away. But as a psychologist, what he saw is that the people who actually died quickly were not necessarily the ones who were most infirmed. They were the people who lost a sense of meaning. So for me, at a time when I was going through difficult times, I decided to distill man's search for meaning down into an equation that I could remember. And I call these emotional equations. Um, and this is my next book, which is coming out in January. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> this is my way of actually, I didn't at the time, I had no idea it was gonna be a book, that's for sure. It was my way of actually reminding myself on a daily basis what was important in life. Y'all, most of y'all uh, probably studied uh, algebra. In algebra, you have constants and you have variables. And in life, we have constants and we have variables. The constant in this equation is suffering, especially if you're in a concentration camp, especially if you have it, you're in a prison of your own mind in a recession. The variable is meaning. The way the math works, increase the meaning, you have less despair. So I started living this on a daily basis. It was my mantra. It was my heuristic. It was what I used on a daily basis on a tough day. Curious thing was I start, there were people in the company who actually were living a lot of suffering. And I went to a general manager's meeting at one point and, and actually was supposed to give a speech to all of our general managers in the company with, you know, and a bunch of other managers. It was about 100 people. And I threw the speech away because what I saw in the room was such a level of suffering that I just decided to actually talk about this mantra this emotional equation. And afterwards, people were really appreciating. They appreciated the fact that somebody could talk about the big white elephant in the room. So I started asking myself, you know, maybe there are emo other emotional equations. All of my general managers left, and some of them texted and tweeted the equation. And next thing I knew, I decided to study the idea of how do you mix equations. Well, Sir Isaac Newton's famous for gravity. He's famous for creating telescope. He's famous for a lot of, he helped create calculus. But he also created the color wheel. And if you take blue and you take red, you get purple. This is what happens with our emotions also. Dr. Robert Pluchek, 20, 30 years ago, created the wheel of emotions. You take joy and you take trust and you get love. You take a weather system, certain barometric pressures and certain altitudes, you get a, a rainstorm, a snowstorm. Or we have internal weather systems. And our internal weather systems include our emotions. So I actually decided to start studying emotions. I was a CEO on the, you know, I was a CEO on the side doing my CEO thing and then studying emotions. And I went to Bhutan. I went to the little country of Bhutan between India and, and China and studied their gross national happiness index. And I came back with this equation, which I was lucky enough to present at the TED conference in Long Beach last year. Happiness equals wanting what you have divided by having what you want. Or in other words, what I learned in Bhutan, and what I've learned from you know, studying the idea of happiness since then, is happiness is really about gratitude. It's about appreciating what we have. It's about actually knowing that you should actually focus on those things on a daily basis, as opposed to having what you want, the act of gratification, going out and getting it. Or to put it in sort of American terms, it's practice versus pursuit. We are taught as an inalienable right in our, in, our, uh, uh, in our Declaration of Independence about the pursuit of happiness. Well, if you read about pursuit in the dictionary, you may see the actual um, dictionary definition as to chase with hostility. <laughs> Do we chase happiness with hostility in this country? I don't know. So practicing happiness is different than pursuing it. So I started spending time with our managers and teaching them emotional equations. Workaholism, which is something that we see a lot in a, a recession. What are you running from? It's an addiction. Divided by what are you living for? As opposed to calling. When you're living your calling, it's pleasure over pain. You have a very high pain threshold when you're living your calling. Anxiety, the number one contagious emotion in American companies today is fear. Fear is contagious. When you have the flu, 
your job at, jo at your work, they say, go home. When you have the fear, <laughs> they don't say you go home. They just say, you know, we all have the fear. <laughs> Anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness, meaning what you don't know versus what you can't control. So when you're in a state of anxiety, focus on what you do know and what you can control, assuming that you believe that there's the illusion of control in life. <laughs> Finally, curiosity equals wonder plus awe. When we're children, we're in a state of wonder. When we're in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, we're in a state of awe, the magnificence of everything bigger than us. In between those bookends, we lose curiosity. And what does that do to us? The Economist, two months ago, cover article on the joy of growing old, or why, be, why life begins at 46. This was actually a graph in it. This is a graph of self-reported well-being, or in essence, the happiness of those of us in the United States based upon age. Those of you who are 18 to 21, it's all downhill for a while. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're, you sort of peak at age 18 and it goes down. But the truth is, look at this. It's lowest between age 46 and 50. And that's actually when my friends committed suicide. It's at that point in our life when that intersection of psychology and business is most congested and stressful. And we lose our curiosity. We don't ask, why, is it, why am I feeling this? We just sort of feel like we're on freeway in a, in, a, in a traffic jam, and we want to escape. Daniel Goleman has done a lot of work on emotional intelligence. Uh, he's written a great book called Emotional Intelligence and a bunch of, of, of follow-up books on that. And he's proven that two-thirds of the success of a leader in business is due to emotional intelligence, and only one-third is due to IQ or level of experience. So, if that is true, I have three suggestions of how we can improve the psychohygiene at work. Psychohygiene is an Abe Maslow expression, by the way, not all that well known. But if two thirds of business leadership is really about, and success, is due to emotional intelligence, maybe we should stop teaching so many strategy courses or reading a balance sheet courses or things like that in corporate universities. Maybe we should start teaching people in company universities about how to get in touch with their emotions. No. <laughs> Number two is it's time for us to evaluate our managers and leaders on a different set of metrics. This is how we do it in my company with 3,500 employees. Results are on one, on one axis, relationships are on the other. We rate you as a manager based upon a one to four scale of results and then on relationships. Generally, most companies actually ju just judge you based upon your results. And in the process, you may have a wake of wreckage of people to create those results. And it's a very short-term strategy, but for your bonus, guess what? It's what you do. In our company, we do not actually give people a promotion to the next level unless they're in quadrant one, which means they have to be good at both results and relationships. Finally, when I was 23 years old, I graduated from Stanford Business School really young. I graduated at age 23 from Stanford Business School. I was ready to go take on the world. And I believed at age 23 that my success was a fun, and maybe my desire to be a CEO someday was meant that I had to be a superhuman. I had to be bigger than a human. And what I've come to learn in doing this now for 24 years of being a CEO is it isn't about being a superhuman, it's about being a superhuman. So my final thought is that the most neglected fact in business today is not about technology, it's not about strategy, it's not about reading balance sheets, it's that we're all human. And I think it's time that we start making as a prerequisite in hiring CEOs the idea that they didn't get an MBA, but maybe it's time to actually hire people as CEOs who have a master's in psychology. Thank you very much.